not unusual for the sequel <coughs> to a film to be a bit of a flop. The film studio wants to cash in on the success of the original and so they might rush it into production and often, or at least sometimes, it comes with mixed results. However, that can't be said for Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians because it really is just as powerful as the first. But what was it that prompted Paul to write again and to write so soon? Because many commentators suggest that uh, it was written within months or perhaps even weeks after the first, and so <clears throat> it suggested that something must have happened in the city. Was it a theological issue? Uh, because the, uh, or despite the strong faith of these people, there was, there was something that was concerning them. Had persecution gotten worse, uh, leaving them uh, distressed, or worried about their future? However, there is one reason we do know about, and, and that is that somebody had given them some wrong information. And so in the second verse of chapter 2, Paul writes, Don't become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by a letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. And did somebody claim to have a message from the Holy Spirit that contradicted what Paul had been teaching? Had somebody been teaching inconsistently with, to, with Paul and so confusing them about what he had originally meant? Had somebody written a letter claiming to be from Paul but actually mi misrepresenting him? Well, whatever it was, they were unsettled. And Paul says, look, it's not good for you to be alarmed about these things and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned for you as a church. And so his second letter is written in response to that concern. But what's also quite clear is that this whole issue concerning the day of the Lord was confusing to the Thessalonians. His first letter was intended to help to clear up some of their uncertainty. But he's having to write again because they're obviously still confused. Now, a part of that had to do with their background. Uh, many in the church were Gentiles and they had grown up with ideas that were based on their Greco-Roman culture, which meant that they hadn't been exposed to the Jewish ideas, the teachings of the Old Testament. For example, the Greeks and the Romans believed that when a person died, their soul, their suke, would enter this kind of dark spiritual world where they could only guess at what might have taken place. And for their body, the soma, there was, well, there was, there was no reality of life after death for the body. And so their belief and understanding about the afterlife was really quite different from what their Jewish friends in the church had believed. But to make it even more confusing, there were so many different Greek philosophies and ideas that, that often contradicted one another. And so when Paul taught that at his coming, their body would be raised and reunited with their soul, they're probably scratching their heads and thinking, man, that's just not a part of what we learned when we were kids. And I think we all know how difficult it is to overcome those preconceived ideas that we, that we grow up with. And so this all sounded very strange to them, and it's not surprising then that they were confused. Now, the book is divided into three chapters. If you've got your Bible, you might like to open it. We're going to quickly go through this. And it covers a bunch of different topics, but collectively they, they offer some advice on how we should live during the time before Jesus comes again. He begins in the first chapter by encouraging the Thessalonians to persevere in the face of persecution. Writing in verse 4, he says, Among God's churches we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. Now, it's very easy to fall for the idea that being a Christian is supposed to protect us from all the difficult stuff in life. And unfortunately, that message is too often repeated. 
The God that people want today seems to be one of instant answers. When pain comes, we want immediate relief. When difficulty strikes, we want prompt resolution. And when God allows something to happen that we don't understand, we want an answer to that. Paul, however, calls us to persevere. And the reality is that Jesus had earlier warned his disciples that in this world you will have trouble. And Paul stressed to that young preacher, Timothy, that everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. And so like the Thessalonians, we also need to take Paul's advice and, and persevere. And in the previous verse, he gives us a clue as to what can help us to do that. Verse 3, he writes, Your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. And so first of all, we are able to persevere when we continue to grow in our faith because faith isn't something that we receive the full measure of or a full quota of when we, when we first become a Christian. It's a little bit like the sanctification that Paul wrote about in the last verse of his four, uh, first letter. Faith is a growing relationship with God. And it's either growing or it's shrinking. But it never remains the same. And so perhaps a fair question for us would be, is our faith growing more and more? Secondly, we persevere by growing in our love for one another. Paul writes, the love that all of you have for one another is increasing. And of course, it's, it's true, and you know it. We, we need each other. Our love for one another and our need for each other helps to keep us strong. On our own, we can be pretty vulnerable at times, but together we can be, we can be strong. And so we persevere as our faith grows and as we depend on each other. And thirdly, we keep an eye on the future. Because we believe that Jesus is returning and so whatever happens now needs to be understood or needs to be evaluated in the light of that truth. So then what hope does Paul offer in the face of these hard times and especially at the hands of those who might want to hurt us? Well, he writes this in verses 6 through 10. He says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy place and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you and so the question then is when will all that is wrong be made right and Paul says well it'll happen when when Christ comes when Christ is revealed and what will happen well <clears throat> the wicked will be punished and that's why we should be able to and can and should persevere because these present and difficult times will they'll not last forever because we know the one who has the future. And then he ends in the last couple of verses with a prayer. He writes, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 2, Paul returns to a topic that seemed to be causing the most confusion. And honestly, this has to be one of the hardest passages in the New Testament to, to try and figure out. 
and especially as it relates to the man of lawlessness in verse 3 and the one who now restrains it in verse 7. Now, a part of our confusion, I think, is just simply a result of our own inquisitive nature. We just want to know answers to all of these things. But it also comes from the fact that Paul doesn't really explain the problem. Because in verse 1 and 2, he refers to a conversation that had taken place or to a, a letter that had been written containing some misinformation, but he doesn't exactly tell us what it was. And so he answers a question, but he doesn't tell us what the question was. Now, he realized that the Thessalonians would know what he was talking about because, in fact, in verse 5, he says, When I was with you, I used to tell you these things. But unfortunately, we don't have that inside information, which makes this one of the most mysterious passages in the New Testament and results in numerous opinions about who or what is the man of lawlessness and who or what is now restraining it. However, there are some, I guess, some key points you could say that... Um, uh, they just might help us to understand it a little bit better. But what we need to do is always keep in mind the big picture in all of this, and that is despite the mysterious nature of what's written, the main point here is that Jesus is one day going to return. First of all, in verse 2, he says, Don't become easily unsettled or alarmed, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Now, some of these folk, it seems, were really upset, and Paul didn't want that. Don't be worried about these things. Don't let this unsettle your faith, he, he says, with really the caring heart of a caring minister. He says, being alarmed about the future events, that's just not going to help you. Don't, don't worry about these things. Now, they were troubled because they simply were having a hard time understanding Paul. But then somebody came along and began to contradict him, and that only added to their confusion. Indeed, if you put yourself in their place for just a moment and imagine how you would feel if you thought that the day of the Lord had already come and you'd missed it, that would be unsettling, wouldn't it? And so Paul is saying, look, I, I don't want you to be alarmed. I don't want your faith to be unsettled. And then he says that he doesn't want them to be deceived in verse 3. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. In other words, something is going to happen before the day of the Lord comes, and since that hasn't happened, look, there's no need to worry about it. You haven't missed out on his return. Look, I'm still here, and you're still here, and we're all fair income believers, so obviously some sort of secret rapture hasn't taken place. But that still leaves the question, and that is what is to come, and what is the rebellion, and who is the man of lawlessness? 2,000 years, Christians have desperately tried to figure that out. So let's just take a very quick history lesson. Because in the first century, and under Roman rule, the number one candidate for the man of lawlessness was the Roman emperor. Between 37 and 41 AD, Caligula set up a statue of himself in the temple in Jerusalem and demanded that the people worship him. Nero ruled from 54 to 68 AD, and especially after the persecution of about 64 AD, he then became the prime candidate. And then, when some early Christians added up the numerical value of his name in the Hebrew language and it came to 666, well, they were absolutely certain that he had to be the man of lawlessness. But after many years, and the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, then the Roman empress, they suddenly didn't fit the bill anymore. But then came the Vandals, 
And they were originally from Spain. They invaded North Africa and then on into Europe and the old Roman Empire. And they followed a sort of very strange form of Christianity called Arianism. And some of their leaders then to openly began to persecute the Catholic leaders of the day. And so guess who became the next candidate for the man of lawlessness? When Islam began to spread over the world, Muhammad was a man of lawlessness. The reformers, uh, Wycliffe and Huss, Luther and Calvin, Knox and Kramer, all said that the Pope or a succession of popes was most definitely the man of lawlessness. And so the Roman Catholics returned the favour and said that Martin Luther was actually the man of lawlessness. And on and on it's gone until the last century when the German Kaiser was the man in uh, WW1 and, of course, Hitler and Mussolini, one of them had to be in WW2. And so how do we understand all of this? Next week we're going to have a really long service and so get prepared just in this one here. No, 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 not really. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not sure that I understand this at all. <laughs> and so perhaps the best we can do, the best we can do is really just consider what Paul said. And the first he is the man of lawlessness, which means that he is against the law. He rebels against the law of God and he rebels against the law of man. Secondly, it says he is doomed to destruction, which means that despite how difficult or how terrifying it might get, or has been, or whatever it is, his fate is sealed, and he will not win, and God is always, and still is, in control. So he's against the law, he's doomed to destruction, and then verse 4 says he puts himself in the place of God. He writes, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God, or is worshipped, so that he himself... Oh, see, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now this leads us then to the fourth point, and that is, how do we prepare? So that we are not deceived. As Paul says in verse 5, remember what you have been taught. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And so the best way for us to guard against deception is, of course, the Scriptures. Always has been, always will be. And so using the Scriptures, we can be ready. And then in verse 7, especially in verse 7, but really through, uh, through to verse 10, Paul says, look, while you're considering this, while you're thinking about all of this, remember that God is sovereign. God is in control. Verse 7 says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. <clears throat> now that's interesting, isn't it? In other words, this was already happening when Paul writes this. Carries on, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And so because this was happening, in some form or another, the Thessalonians probably understood what was holding back the appearance of the man of lawlessness much more than what we do today. But whoever or whatever it is that's holding back evil, they are God's agent in his grand plan. And while some men will have or act with exceptional evil, we have to remember that God is still in charge. And while the identity and the nature of the one who holds it back is not easy for us to understand, it's not easy for us to determine or to try and figure out, the demise of the man of lawlessness is, Paul adds in verse 8, the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of of his coming. And so the main point in all of this is the assurance is that God is in control. Now, honestly, I haven't a clue <laughs> what the restrainer is or this one that's holding us back. And Again, that has been endlessly debated for the last 2,000 years. 
So perhaps what we really need to hold on to is that everything is happening according to God's plan and there is no need for us to be alarmed. And finally, in chapter 3, Paul calls us to stick to the business of Christian living, living for Christ. And he begins with a request uh, to pray for the lost and for spreading the gospel. He says, finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured just as it was with you. Uh, Secondly, we should pray for believers who are undergoing hard times. He writes, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not everyone has faith. And then we are to act responsibly and we are to demand that same sense of responsible living from each other. And he really uses some kind of strong words in his warning in verse 6. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. Now, some of this was probably due to the fact that the Greeks and the Romans weren't that eager to work, and that's why they had slaves. (laughs) They did all the work. They just sat around and partied. But more than likely, it relates to the problem that he describes in verse 11 when he says, We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Now, the problem seems to be that some of these folk were just poking their noses into other people's business, and that was due to this confusion over the second coming. They were convinced that the end was so near that they quit their jobs. And they didn't see any need for planting any new crops, and now they just sat around on the hill and twiddled their thumbs and poked their noses in other people's business, and it was just wrong. Just like the foolish virgins in the parable that Jesus told, they they now wanted their more responsible brothers and sisters in the church to to bail them out of the problems that they brought brought upon themselves. So Paul requests that they act responsibly and that those who should work, they should work. And if you refuse to work, then you didn't have the right to bludge off the goodwill of your Christian brothers and sisters. Now, there are some people who are so stubborn and headstrong that they will never respond to to kindness. And so perhaps tough love is perhaps the only answer. Contributing to or condoning somebody's bad behaviour is is not love, no matter how hard you want to look at it. And so Paul's final warning in these last couple of verses, it sounds harsh, Sometimes it's necessary. And so he writes in verse 14 and 15. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as the enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Now the intention of what he is saying here is not to punish these people but it is to make them feel ashamed about, about their actions, about, about what they're doing. But it is also to bring them to a point of repentance in their life. And that's important. And then the chapter ends with a little prayer. And perhaps in your mind's eye, can you imagine uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy and they're gathered around this little table and there's perhaps maybe a little oil lamp there and they've, they've got the letter and they're, they're looking back over the things that have been written and they remember what was written in the first letter and, and so they're carefully considering the most suitable words to write to close out this last message. 
It's about then that Paul picks up the pen himself because he'd used a scribe up until this point to write the letter. And in his farewell message to his friends, he ends just as he began, emphasizing some of the major themes in the book. For those who had suffered hardship, affliction, confusion and chaos, he prays that the Lord of peace would give them peace at, at all times. And then in his own handwriting, he, he scrawls out the words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And how appropriate. And no doubt, these people had heard Paul say that many times, but now they read it in his own handwriting. He's saying that peace would be impossible without the presence of God and without the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so imagine the comfort that that would bring to those folk there in Thessalonica. May we also understand that comfort. May we also live in peace. And may we also appreciate the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.